Welcome to the Three Forms Podcast, a joint production of Beaver Dam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. Together we are touring our historic three forms of unity, the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. Considering how these old and trusted paths can equip and lead God's people in the midst of today's challenges. So let's start this week's episode. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Pastor Lloyd Hemstreet. And I am Reverend Tyler Wagamaker. We are on episode 34, Lord's Day 34 of the Heidelberg Catechism, heading into God's law as we continue to explore how we live gratitude uh, out, how we live thankfully with all of our lives. The good old Ten Commandments. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so we are heading into the Ten Commandments. It was kind of teed up for us a little bit last Lord's Day. In uh, Lord's Day 33, question 91, it was the question about what is good. And one of the understandings that the Heidelberg lays out for us is, is something for something to be good, it needs to conform to God's law. And so now we're going to begin exploring in a bit more detail on mm-hmm. uh, God's law. Together. Yes. So, so that's what we're doing today. Uh, we got a little bit of ground to cover, though. Four questions, five questions, answers. It's yeah, it's and the, and the first one is work. all ten commandments. Yeah. So, so we should so probably head into that. We'll go ahead and, <laughs> and dive right in. So, uh, Lord's Day thirty four, question ninety two. It starts out with, "What does the Lord say in His law?" Answer: God spoke all these words. The first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your manservant or your maidservant or your cattle or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The sixth commandment, you shall not kill. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox, or his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. That's the 10 of them, Tyler. That that is 10. We divide them, by the way, a little bit differently than, let's say, the Lutherans do. I was always perplexed by that. Uh, I you know, I come. I came to learn that many years ago, and that, for instance, the Lutherans divide their Martin Luther divided a little bit differently. Because I pulled up, you know, on the internet some meme or something, Ten Commandments, just some uh, p, you know, image file, and it listed the Ten Commandments. I'm like, wait, they've numbered it wrong. <laughs> So that's just kind of a, an interesting thing that they combine. For instance, the first, you know, you said first commandment, second commandment, they combine those two into one. And then the 10th commandment, our 10th commandment, they divide that into two, uh, which is just kind of an oddity. I just mentioned that just as a yeah. uh, type of an oddity on there. A L- so. little bit of a, a strange aside. And yeah. A factoid, if you're playing uh, some sort of uh, Bible trivia game that's Lutheran, that's right, you those, better know which it is so that you don't get the 10 commandments wrong. Those crazy Lutherans, crazy. <laughs> Lutherans, that's what, that's what it is. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, but the law is a good gift, by it, the way. It is a good gift. Um, and that's one of the things, uh, it, you know, 
it's important to to come to that to just be reminded of that because the law certainly there's an element where it's a burden to us. In fact, I, I um uh, there are the three uses of the law. And yeah, the the reform three uses of the law. Historically, uh, reformed Christians have understood that God has given His law, and there's multiple purposes that it has. Uh, first, it would be the conviction of sin. Passages like uh, Romans three nineteen point us to how that. Uh, God's law was given so that every mouth might be silenced so that the whole world would be accountable to God. Because when we see God's law, we see how far short of that our goodness ma- uh, matches up and, and what we need to grow in. Uh, the second use of the law is that God's law being proclaimed and declared in the world, it has an effect of restraining sin in the world. That there's, uh, we can think that we're lawless or a law to ourselves, but when we hear an outside standard, we recognize, oh, 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 I might need to be more careful. Uh, you know, speed limit signs, people don't always obey those real particularly. But there's a difference between a 70 mile per hour and a 25 mile per hour speed limit sign, and they'll generally respond a little differently Mm -hmm. just because that standard is out there. And so by God's law being proclaimed into the world, we have that restraining effect on sin that it naturally has. Or the 75 mile per hour, which in northern Michigan, they've they've upped it to, which I'm very thankful for. There, so, there, there and some of those western states have like 80 miles an hour. They, they uh, do. I'm not hour. sure if any have any beyond that. Montana used to have n- is areas of road with no speed limit. Yeah, but, and then they, they but, cut, they, they, you're right, I think they scaled that back to yeah, like 80 miles yeah, an hour, which like is that. still going a good clip. It is. So it, it is. is. Yeah. Anyway, the third use of the law, Tyler, is uh, as a rule of gratitude. And that's what the catechism is highlighting as, for us as it is not it did not go through the Ten Commandments in how great our sin and misery are. Right, right. It, it did point to the, God's law in that, and Jesus' summary specifically of of the law in that, the, what's the first and greatest commandment. But the third use of the law is that it gives us a real tool and understanding to know what is the way that I should live. What is What is goodness going to look like here? What can I do that brings honor and glory to Christ for the salvation that I've been given. And that's why it's a good gift. The it, law is a good it gift. Is. I mean, it reflects God's holiness and righteousness and beauty and his well-ordering of the world and uh, how things just go so much better for you. Uh, right. For instance, right. like the commandment that if you honor your parents, then you know it may go well with you in the yeah. long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to yeah. you. And that applies to all the commandments in that sense yes. because things will go better for you. Right. Um, in that sense, it's a good gift. Um, right. Even though we can't, perfectly keep the law right do uh, are are we saved by our keeping of the ten commandments tyler are we saved by our keeping of the ten commandments um well if i kept all the ten, if i kept all the commandments perfectly i guess in one sense you could say i i would inherit eternal life um but the, of course the problem is i i can't keep them perfectly we don't, so right uh, i am not saved by the keeping of the law because right. i can't keep the law well you're not saved by your keeping of the yes law. correct Christ kept the law, he, however, perfectly. He, he kept all 10 of these commandments perfectly, and it's that perfect righteousness that is placed on the believer's yes. account. So we are saved by the keeping of the Ten Commandments. It's just not our keeping. Exactly. It's so, Christ. So thankfully for the uh, the act of obedience of Jesus Christ, yes. uh, that he actively, he kept it. And yes. so now I stand in the presence of God as if I have never sinned, um, and in fact have perfectly kept the law. Yep. And now, out of gratitude, we seek to try and up our game a bit and keep these, <laughs> keep the law a little better. That's right. As we want to be thankful for what Christ has accomplished for us. So, so those are the ten. Yes. Uh, question, but we can divide them a little bit more in the yeah, catechism. Does. That's that's what the catechism is going to do in question ninety three. How are these commandments divided? And the answer it gives is into two tables. The first has four commandments teaching us what our relation to God should be. The second has six commandments, teaching us what we owe our neighbors. Kind of like the summary of the law. What is, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And that that's the two tables of, of the law there. Right. Um, and the summary of it is is love. Love is love, you know, <laughs> Lloyd. Uh, Godly love is love, you know. <laughs> so God fun. is the one. God is the one who has the right to tell us what love is ah, and looks yes. like and define it. And so, not everything that the world 
wants to label as love actually matches up to what God's standard for love is. Well, and, and sometimes even those in, in a Christian tradition will say, well, so long as we are loving others, and they use it this kind of generic, nebulous almost sense of love, and be like, well, what what do you mean by love? Is this an emotion? Is this a be nice? What what is the the love? Because a lot of times Christians will will use that as their compass based on whether they say something is a sin or not a sin. And as Christians, we go back to well, th- that's the summary of the law. But let's unpack it even more. Right. Let's go to, for instance, the Ten Commandments because right. that does unpack what love looks like. Because yes. love is a verb. Yes. Uh, love is action, too. Love is being lived out. You have out. to go deeper. You have yes. to go deeper. And and that's what God's Word does in the Ten Commandments and what the Heidelberg is helping us see as it goes ahead and goes through these Ten Commandments. So, so the, the Heidelberg is interesting because it introduces the Ten Commandments all in all, and then in the same Lord's Day, it dives us into the First Commandment. Right. So it's like, welcome to the law, let's go right to the first. <laughs> yes, yes. Which means our clock's running for this show, and we got to... Keep moving here because we got to get into the first commandment. But but, it, but thankfulness is important. I just mentioned that again because you you know you mentioned that third use of the law and giving expression of thankfulness is really really important right. um, of how we live out our faith, how we we demonstrate to God that we truly are thankful that this is not just something that that we've received by inheritance and we we aren't uh, appreciative of it. It you know. Uh, it, it's important to give thanks. I think about how often in our lives do we give thanks? Like when I was down in Louisiana, for instance, I uh, visited Chaplain Baker. He, dear supervising chaplain when I was over in Iraq, and he made this amazing gumbo soup, Louisiana gumbo. It's so delicious. So what is the best way that a Dutchman from uh, West Michigan can thank some uh, Louisiana Cajun sort of uh, sort of you know, meal that was provided for me down in northern Louisiana, um, uh, of course, is to give them um, Dutch l- black licorice, uh-huh. um, uh, dropsies, and uh, and uh to be able to really enjoy that. So, you know, I'll enjoy your Cajun, and you get the uh, Dutch black licorice, which I don't... Have you ever had that before? I have, I have. And yes. you love it, right, right? Um, some, uh, black licorice isn't my favorite. But, but this is the real salty kind, of I, course. It's no, a, it's, it's, it's still it's, not, it's not that awesome. No, no, okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank uh, But I'll try the gumbo. <laughs> the the ten, ten Commandments are even, are even better than Dutch uh, black licorice. Okay, yes. very good, very good. All right, so question 93, um, or 94, uh, it says... What does the Lord require in the first commandment? And, of course, once again, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. The answer that it gives is that I, not wanting to endanger my very salvation, avoid and shun all idolatry, magic, superstitious rites, and prayers to saints or to other creatures, that I sincerely acknowledge the only true God, trust him alone, look to him for every good thing, Humbly and patiently love him, fear him, and honor him with all my heart. In short, that I give up anything rather than go against his will in any way. Trust. Uh, I mean, that's that's part of this. Uh, when I think about question answer 94, and then we'll get to that in the next question answer 95 too, they both talk about trust, mm-hmm. the, amount, the importance of trusting. Like, says, I sincerely acknowledge the only true God, question answer 94, says, trust him alone. Again, trust, we have, a, we have trust issues in our, in our culture. Well, just in humanity. Yeah. Um, overall, we have trust issues. And the first commandment is, is saying, are you, well, not are you, it's challenging us, you need to trust uh, mm-hmm. the Lord God alone, ultimately, for your eternity, for your life, for, for everything. And we have a hard time doing that as people. We, we truly do have trust issues. But idolatry, in many ways, strikes me as, as an active attempt by our mind, by our heart, to not trust God, to, have, in fact, avoid trusting God. And instead, what do we do? We, we trust others. We Or trust other people. We trust other things. Those are what become idols in our lives. I mean, and, and of course, Lloyd, it can be just the multiplicity of things, um, all sorts of things. Though. I mean, it could be belonging to a gym or an athletic club, but that could be something. It could be uh, one's political party or, or a political leader or a candidate or something or a king or, or, or a president, or it could be chocolates. Um, right. Uh, I right. mean, something that's like, 
Uh, or what? Dutch Dutch licorice, I guess, <laughs> um, uh, could be. Or it could be pot. Right. Uh, I mean, any sort of drugs, alcohol. It could be academics. People people want to trust maybe their mind or their academic degree. I mean, that's that's an idol. Um, certain bands, mm-hmm. you know, roadies, something like that. Um, well, I mean, uh, you could think of a passage like <laughs> Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, the first part of Ephesians 5, is dealing with a couple of sins that are named in the Ten Commandments, specifically sexual immorality, adultery, as well as covetousness. And so Ephesians 5 declares uh, uh, here in verse 5, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So how did idolatry get connected to sexual immorality and covetousness. I mean, these are it's mixing together the Ten Commandments. And the reason is, in many ways, all sin is a form of idolatry. Mm. All sin that mm. we engage in, any sins of commission, are a form of idolatry because we're putting that over what Christ has said, this is the way you should live, this is how you should honor me. And we're choosing that sin over him. It is an example of idolatry wherever it may show up and whichever of the Ten Commandments or however many of the Ten Commandments might be applicable to that sin. And one of the wonderful things of how God God convicts us and breaks us down is and where we find that we are failing to keep the first commandment is sometimes he brings hardships into our life to strip away these idols, these things that we've put our trust in. And to say, you know, you've put your eggs in this basket and let me just show you where this is going to end up. Um, I'm going to take it away from you or I'm going to, you know, destroy this or, you know, something's going to happen where, you're going to be faced with with having put your life and invested your life in these sets of, these sorts of idols, and they don't satisfy ultimately. And of course, that's idols will always come up short. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think about like Psalm 143, for instance, and David. He he talks about how he really needed to come to a place of neediness first before in life God needed to strip away a lot of things um, for him to truly get to the point where he said, "I trust in you, Lord. I need need you." So. Verse three and verse four, for instance, he says, I I remember the days of long ago. I meditate in all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a like a parched land. Or verse three, the enemy pursues me, crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. And the the psalm is filled with a couple of these verses where there's just a neediness. He's he is broken down, David is. And but then where does he where does it lead him to? It leads him to a place like verse eight and verse nine. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. So there's that trust language. The catechism uses that. David uses that language here in Psalm 143 or verse 9. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord, for I hide myself in you. And this is in many ways an acknowledgement to living into more so that first commandment that all these other things will from the world will will a- attack these idols ultimately these idols will flee from us won't be able to hold us up and we need to be taught that and that's one of the wonderful things that god does it's one of the, the wonderful things sometimes about losses we lament losses we lament pain but but god does use that in order to to teach us that we ultimately need to put our trust in him and him alone mm-hmm. and not in all these other things a lot of times they're very good things lloyd mm-hmm. they're wonderful things but we can our hearts are so easily inclined to want to not trust god the way we need to and to trust these other things and god sometimes that's to shake our lives and and but that's when the gospel needs to again in people's lives be there to to say okay here's jesus yeah. Again, I know you've been wayward. Perhaps you maybe didn't even know how wayward you were, but here's Jesus. Let's go back to Jesus and and trust in him. Yep. Absolutely. So Yeah. One of the one of the things that we should cover about and and we see here in how the Heidelberg deals with the first commandment too, is that if you just look at the Ten Commandments, how they're written, 
there's a bunch of negative uh, thou shalt nots. That's what we have throughout the Ten Commandments. However, the Heidelberg, in the way that it addresses each and every one of these commandments, is that it not only gives you the thou shalt not and gives examples of things we should not be involved in and participating in, but it also gives a positive. Hmm, that's a good this point. This is what we are called to do. You know, you could uh, take someone that— uh, the, you know, first commandment, thou shall not have any other gods before me. And a atheist could say, well, I don't believe in any gods, so I'm fine by that. Well, the Heidelberg wants to correct him and say, yeah, not just no other gods, but you have to worship the true and living God as mm. he deserves and requires. And that atheist is, in his own mind, deceived as he's making a god out of all sorts of other things in this life, as we so naturally do with our sinful nature. And that's a that's a wonderful point you brought that out, Lloyd, that the Catechism, so often with these Ten Commandments, it brings out the the thou shalt not, but also the thou shalt right. um, aspect of it, too. And and this is a, a, a great example of that, mm-hmm. um, that you just brought up there, too. Yep. Tim Keller, speaking about idolatry, because things that take the place of God, trusting him, um, looking to to him, loving him, fearing him, honoring him, things we know we ought to do. The catechism reminds us of that. But idolatry, a lot of times, Tim Keller said, is taking a good thing and, and turning it into an ultimate thing. And mm-hmm. I always thought that was one good way to really, uh, a helpful way to understand the first commandment, and really a breaking of the first commandment, right. where we will take good things. Uh, I think he did it in his book, Counterfeit Gods, where mm-hmm. there are many different, quote-unquote, gods out there that vie for our ultimate trust. And uh, again, think about how many things are good things in our lives that we sometimes by just a little bit incrementally, we slowly turn into ultimate things, Mm -hmm. really good gifts. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, idols are historically, a lot of times people think of idols as these little, like maybe ceramic things or metal things or wood things. Um, but all they are is just really giving expression to things that people really valued, that they loved. Uh, idols, these false gods were just avenues by which people were getting things that, that were good, like a good harvest right. or more children right. or, or, through it. or a blessed marriage mm-hmm. um, in, the, in this life or favor with the king. I mean, these are good, wonderful things that people are just seeking. But the problem is they were, they were seeking it apart from God or they were right. seeking it, again, in, in and of itself rather than God, knowing that he's ultimately the giver of all things yes. and of eternity. Um, I, I, I brings me back to the story in Genesis where Lot and his uncle Abram, they part ways. And this is a place where there's some really good things. So Genesis 13, verse 10, Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, um, like the land of Egypt toward Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So I start out there, for instance, Lloyd, and I think these are good gifts mm-hmm. in, in terms of who doesn't want a, a really nice meadow to raise your flocks. Right. That's and, what that's what he was picking. That was what he was selecting. Yeah, and, and there's a nearby cosmopolitan city. You could probably go to the movies, you know, a nice mall there in Sodom and Gomorrah, um, <laughs> all the latest shopping conveniences, uh, a walled city that if there was an attack, he could go flee there and be safe. Wasn't entirely how it worked out, but, um, uh, but it was <laughs> a nice in theory. It was nice in theory. And so that's where he's like, okay, so, but in some sense, it's like, well, already he's, he's, ch- He's making bad choices. Uh, you know, there was a, there was conflict between him and Abram with their, with their flocks. In some sense, he'd be like, "But it's it's better for me to to hitch my wagon with Abram rather than to separate ways because to want wealth, more wealth." Right. And so he's already choosing wealth and creature comforts already by separating from Abram rather than saying, "Okay, you know." Earthly goods really aren't worth it. I need to be with my godly, godly uncle who was right. called to this land by God. Right. So, so already he's making some bad choices, 
And then the next chapter, Genesis 14, Lot has like a brush with death. This is sometimes where God comes in and he shakes us up and he's like, you're trusting in the wrong things. Um, So Genesis 14, uh, starting with verse 10. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. So so now he's living in the city. It's not just in the plain. So he's living in the city. God's like shaking him up. It's like, this is a wicked city. I'm going to take away all all the reasons you move there. I'm going to take away all these sheep. Um, uh, your life is is in danger itself. You have a brush with death. This just shows you the insidiousness of, of idols mm-hmm. because he has a brush with death. Abram, his uncle, comes and rescues him. What happens? Does he say, okay, I made a mistake. I should live with you, Abram. No. He goes back. He goes back. Yep. <laughs> it's like this just shows the hold that idols can have right. on our lives. Seemingly good things. You know, he's gotten very comfortable there. You know, his daughter's now married two boys from uh from from Sodom and that and that city. So then we come to a place like Genesis chapter 19. This just shows you the hold again that idols can hold on people's lives. So now the city is going to get destroyed. Verse 14, so Lot went spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming dawn, the angels urged Lot saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here or you'll be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. I'm like, even with all that, the, right. the hold of these idols right. on Lot, he, he even hesitated, knowing all of this. Uh, you know, sons-in-laws are, are a lost case, right. so they're going to be burned up um, on there. But idols, they hold on. This is just the danger of, of idolatry. Yeah. It yeah. Just, they hold on tightly. Right. And how do you know when you get an idol? It fights back. When you try to take it out of your life— um, uh, it 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 fights dirty mm-hmm. um, on there, and uh, I think about you know Lord of the Rings with Bilbo, the Bilbo Baggins with the ring, and it had become an idol to him, yeah. and uh, you know my it almost like my precious, and and then all of a sudden Frodo shows the ring, and he's like ah, all of a sudden like this demonic face in the movie that just comes out because he's like ah it, that that. He realizes the the hold that the that idol ring has on his heart, and it's it's corrupted him. And he's like, "Oh, it's just taken him over." And that's what idols do. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need God to ask God, wean this from me. Right. Help me fight against this. Bring this to reality in my mind. Right. Take this away. Uh, we've been dealing with idolatry, but we should cover question 95 here. Uh, what is idolatry? And the answer that the catechism gives in question 95, idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. This is exactly what we're dealing with here, this reality of idolatry. The first commandment comes to us to wake us up from that danger that we so naturally slip into and fall into. Even, you know, in question 94, it talked about good things that we can twist and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, taking those that are, are are have gone before us. And, um, you know, it talks about the danger of prayer to saints or yeah. these sorts of things that you can, you know, it is such a blessing to read a biography of Christians that have gone before that, you know, they learn from how they walked with the Lord and the struggles that they went through. But, we can take that and say, oh, I'm going to elevate them. I'm mm-hmm. going to go ahead and say, oh, yay, they're, that, that's who I want to be. Like, I'll start praying to them. What? No, that's, <laughs> that's not how it goes. Mary was wonderful. The Virgin Mary was wonderful. Uh, tremendously used by God and uh, encourages us and challenges us. But, but boy, you go, especially you go to a place like Central America or South America, and many missionaries will say this, and she has, she has taken the place of Jesus in many ways, certainly on the level of Jesus. And um, it's where people are praying to her, you know, candles are lit to her, asking for Mary to intercede for them, and, and worshiping her in many ways. I know 
they will say, oh, they don't worship them. You go to, especially Central and South American nations, many of them, the Roman Catholic Church, they are worshiping Mary uh, on there. And it has become, it, it has become a falsehood. Um, it has become a, a false religion. It's idolatry. Ways. It's idolatry. And and those who were caught up in it and set free from that, they will say that. They will say, I was I was wrapped up in idolatry there. So even aspects of, of the, the church can easily fall into this sin. And the Protestant reformers obviously saw that in their day, which is why they're like, yeah, don't go praying to saints. Right. You pray to God. Right. Um, uh, saints are wonderful. They've done wonderful things, exactly like you said, but they're not God. They are sinners saved by grace, just like the rest of us who are all saints. Right. Um, in that sense. So absolutely the, the problem of idolatry for sure. It is. It is. So this is what we're looking at in the first commandment here. This is the challenge that we have. Not only is it no other gods, no elevating anything, uh, any of the good gifts that God has given us to this place of an ultimate, but also the call, the positive call to sincerely acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways and to live that holiness out more and more. This is the work of gratitude as it ties into the first commandment, and uh, we will continue to explore gratitude in the rest of these commandments next Lord's Day. Thanks for joining us on the Three Forms podcast, a joint ministry of Beaverdam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. To contact us, feel free to reach out through our Facebook page, Substack, on YouTube, or email us directly at threeformspodcast at gmail.com. Three Forms podcast, walking the good and trusted old paths together.